hopefully you can laugh with those and remember some of the things that are going on uh, at Grace Life. Uh, let me speak to a couple of those things uh, real quick. Don't forget, we haven't been together on a Wednesday night for dinner in quite a while, so uh, let's join together this Wednesday night, bring Italian food with you, and um, we'll share with each other, and then we'll just have a little discussion, conversation around the table. That's what we've been doing uh, on Wednesday nights uh, when we met. So we had a Thanksgiving dinner, and then we did uh, a Christmas chili uh, dinner we were supposed to carol but it rained that night we didn't get to and then we started the year off uh, at Maranatha Wednesday night um, and what an incredible time we had there and God helped us thank you all for being there for encouraging us and supporting us a wonderful crowd wonderful turnout and God really helped uh, from Frank and Angie and Jennifer singing with the worship team there to even the message God helped us so appreciate uh, that we are having that men's breakfast on the 28th uh, if you would sign up on the app we would appreciate that to kind of know how many to prepare for uh, this is open to all men from all churches um, the Lord has been I, I've been making contact with guys here in the valley some going to church other churches some not at all I met a, a retired state trooper yesterday at breakfast and invited him so uh, looking forward to what God's going to do with the men's ministry. Bring as many men and young men as you would and want to. We would uh, just need to know so we can fix the breakfast uh, for all of them. Get your Bibles out, your smart devices. Um, Lisa uh, is helping with her daughter little situation this morning there. Everything's fine. God protected, but she's with her and uh, sends her love, so... Um, just be praying for them. Um, what was, Robin, what was your friend's name again? Martha. Martha her five-year-old grandson uh, in the hospital with uh, a virus and double ear infection and pneumonia and possibly some uh, appendix situation. So let's pray for this five-year-old this morning. Other needs came in uh, through the Grace Life Prayer Garden this week. If you haven't joined that on Facebook, join the Grace Life uh, prayer garden and you can see those requests and lift those up but we started last week talking about living well and we talked about where our eyes are focused and we should have our eyes focused on those things eternal uh, the unseen which is really the most realistic it's the greater realm than even the seen and the temporal uh, here and we call that above the line and below the line and we can live well as we focus above the line on those things that are eternal. So I would encourage you to make sure that you listen to that and review that. It's going to be sequential order as we go through these things, building upon precept upon precept to help us uh, in the beginning of the year see how uh, God wants us to live well. You know, John 10.10, 10, he said that uh, the thief came but to kill, steal, and destroy. I don't have time to develop all of that. But the thief just isn't the devil in the context of the scripture. He said, all those who came before me are both thieves and robbers. And if you try to enter in any other way that but through me, you're a thief and a robber. But he ends that verse by saying that I came to give you life and that more abundantly. The Amplified says I came to give you life so that you can enjoy it. Anybody want to enjoy life? Uh, just not waiting to get to heaven so you can enjoy eternity, but abundant life enjoys, it means we can enjoy life in the here and now. And we want to live well. I believe God wants us to live well, and part of living well is understanding wholeness. So turn with me in your Bibles to John, the fifth chapter. If you're familiar with the portion of Scripture there, I'm not going to read all of the first 12 verses, make yourself familiar with it in John 5, but it's the story of Jesus going to the pool of Bethesda. The word Bethesda means house of grace or house of mercy. Can I just stop right here and, and quote T.D. Jakes? Anybody like T.D. Jakes? Uh, he, he says that I want to be a house of grace. I believe we are a house of grace, not just in this building, but each one of us are a house of grace and mercy, extending the grace and mercy to everyone that we come in contact with. And the word Bethesda, 
Uh, their house of grace had five porches. Five is the number of grace and favor. And on all of these porches, the scripture says, there were multitudes of the lame, the halt, the blind, the crippled, the paralyzed. And Jesus focuses his attention on one man. And the scripture says that he had had an infirmity for 30 Eight years, and if you'll draw your attention to verse 6, it says that when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been now a long time in this case, he said to the man, I'm reading from the King James Version, Will thou be made whole? So Jesus asked him a question and underlined that word whole in your Bibles. Make note of that. Some translations might say, Will you be made well, whole and well? The word from the question, wilt thou or will you, means do you have the resolve or do you have the desire? Now, he's not merely talking about uh, somebody wishing that something would happen to change their situation in the future. This implication here from the Greek is Jesus is asking him do you have the desire right now I ask you come on right now I'm asking you that question this morning do you resolve do you have the desire right now to be whole I know Pastor Jen we've been talking things going on in her life health wise she desires, not sometime out in the future. She's been dealing with it for a, a long, many of you have been dealing with it for a long time. Jesus knew that this man had been dealing with this situation for 38 years. I don't believe that you want to wait another 38 years. I don't believe this man wanted to wait another 38 years. He wanted to be made, he had the desire to be made whole right now. That phrase in the Greek, made whole. Be made whole. Jesus, this is really a question. That one phrase. He's saying, are you convinced that you are already whole? Did you hear that? So Jesus isn't asking in the context of what the Greek language says here, do you want to be made whole? He's really saying, are you convinced that you're already whole? Man, that's another question I can ask and we can begin to think about. Are you convinced in your soul, in your spirit, that you are already whole? It's difficult for us sometimes to be convinced that Jesus has already done the work to make us whole when we have pain in our joints and we have physical situations going on, we have mental upheaval, our emotions are all over the map. It's difficult for us. See, Jesus is saying the Greek phrase here is not even in the future tense. He's not saying, do you want to be made whole tomorrow? This verb here is the erost middle infinitive. And I know that doesn't mean anything to most of us, but in the Greek, there's more than just three tenses, past, present, and future. There's eight tenses of the verb, and we have to understand to get the full impact of what Jesus was really saying to this man. He was really saying, he's asking this crippled man, are you ready to abandon how you see yourself? Are you ready right now to abandon the way that you see? Because for 38 years, he's seen himself as unable to move, paralyzed, crippled. A lot of people are paralyzed and crippled by fear and other issues of anxiety. But he's saying, are you really ready to abandon how you see yourself and receive what is already true about you in my eyes. It's a, the imagination is an incredible thing. Have you ever imagined anything at all? Have you ever closed your eyes and imagined that you were someplace that in reality you weren't? I mean, have you ever pictured yourself when there's 12 inches of snow on the ground and it's five below zero and the wind's blowing that you're barefooted in the sand kicking away at the ocean? 
I do it all the time. It's imagination is an incredible thing to make you feel like you're right there. Then you can turn on some ocean music on the computer and put the ocean up on the screen and while the fire's crackling in the background. And <laughs> but the imagination. Jesus not only was imagining this man as whole, he perceived the man as whole. He thought he was broken, but Jesus didn't see him as broken. I have a word for you this morning. Jesus does not see you or your situation as broken. Can anybody say praise God to that? So the question that I'm asking you is the question that Jesus asked this man who was paralyzed for 38 years lying on the mat. Do you, are you ready to abandon the, pre, the concept and the vision of yourself and receive what I believe about you that is true, that you are not broken, that you are already whole and well? If you want to write anything down this morning, just write these words down. Stop seeing yourself any other way than the way Jesus sees you. Because until we do, we will see our lives as broken. Matter of fact, I was talking to Joe yesterday. He, coming through recovery, it was difficult for him to even say that he was an addict anymore. But see, people still will make these kinds of quotes. They'll say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you can't be both. I once was a sinner who was saved by grace, and I'm a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. I no longer identify as a sinner. I identify as a son. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for sending Jesus to heal our broken hearts and set us free from the bruises of our past hurts. We're grateful this morning for the gift of Holy Spirit who's bringing transformation to the way that we think and see ourselves and to the way that we act and behave and even believe. So we fix our eyes on things eternal and not on things temporary. And we focus our hearing now to your voice in Jesus' name. There, God has given us as a gift the power of free will and free choice. That's probably one of the most incredible gifts that we could have received as human beings. You know, um, we just didn't um, become programmed to make certain decisions and we're just all little cookie cutter robots going around. You know, we all wear, <laughs> thank God. We all wear the same clothes. We say all oh, praise God all the same way. We all eat the same food. He gave us personality. He gave us freedom of choice. Now what happens to us in life outside of our choices is not as important to us as it should be or as how we can respond to what has happened to us. Does that make sense? Mark has a free will. In his free will, he makes a choice. In that choice, he hurts me. He offends me. There's trauma there. So I have a choice now to either allow that to impact me throughout the rest of my life and become a victim, blaming him, or I can make a choice to not... Uh, see, I can choose how that impacts me. Now, I understand that there are things that have happened in your life and in my life that we couldn't control and because of other people's free will and the choices that they make, it impacts our life. I'm not denying that at all. But I have the free will and I have the choice to say, I'm going to allow that to impact me this way and I'm going to use it as a, come on somebody, a stepping stone to grow or you can use it as a tombstone and it'll kill you. Okay? But if the choice is yours. They can't choose, even though they made a choice that hurt you, but they can't choose how that impacts and affects your life. Victors take responsibility for their decisions on how to respond to it and get back to winning in life. You cannot change your past, but you can change how it is impacting you right now. I don't know what made the man become 
crippled, paralyzed, to, to have to lie on him. I don't know what brought that about in his life. But Jesus was giving him the opportunity not to allow that to impact him negatively in his life for him to lay there the rest of his life, but it was his choice because Jesus asked a question, will thou be made whole? Are you willing to abandon how you see yourself you're just not a victim of your circumstances. You can choose to rise above it. And Holy Ghost wants to help you rise above it because it's the one that's living in you that helps you and brings you back to this winning in life. Wholeness. That is the state of being perfectly well in body, soul, and spirit. Do you know that that was the original plan of God for mankind? It's the quality of being complete without division, watch this, and without damage. So many are in emotional bondage and turmoil. I believe it's due to, it's due to three things. Um, Frank, is that TV not working? Let me see if it will turn on. It kind of helps me to see if what's on the screen there. We pause 30 seconds for station identification, and we'll be right back to our broadcast. So th this emotional bondage, this turmoil is due, in my opinion, to three major factors. Okay, here they are. Choices, belief systems, and trauma. The choices that you have made or others have made that have affected you your belief systems that normally have been have developed because of the lies that you've believed out of the trauma that has happened to you in your childhood or adolescence. Okay. So these traumas in the child in your childhood and your adolescence lead us to believe lies that develop belief systems. So if it's based upon a lie, then we make choices based on that. And so we stay in, a, in emotional bondage and we stay in turmoil mentally and emotionally. We must stop depending on others to tell us what to do to be healed. We must depend upon the one who knows us best. Who knows you better than anybody knows you? <laughs> The Holy Spirit, his, the paraclete, the paraclete is another helper. He said, it's just like Jesus being with you because I put my spirit in you and he will lead you, guide you, teaching you of all things that I have said. And so he knows us better than we know ourselves. We must learn to trust his voice in telling us what to do. One way to hear his voice is through the scriptures. Holy Spirit makes it easier to understand. Uh, I believe it was Smith Wilgosworth who said, you should not only read the Bible in Greek and Hebrew, but you should read it in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> what did he mean? It's good for us to know the context, the audience, the historical relevance, and the language that, which the Scripture is written in, Hebrew or Greek, but more than anything, what helps us to understand it easier is when we allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate the words off the pages to speak to us in the midst of our turmoil and our grief and say things to us that no one else has been able to communicate with us. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10 says, But God has revealed to us through His Spirit these things, and if you read verse 9, it says it's written, I has not seen, ear hath not heard, mind has not comprehended the things that God has in store for his children. And he, but God's revealed to the, those things to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches the deep things, that's really the deep counsel of God. There is nothing wrong with going to counselors. Please hear me. I am not telling you not to go to a counselor spiritually or cognitively. Okay? Psychological counselors or spiritual counselors. I'm not telling you not to do that. What I am telling you is if you'll read the scriptures, the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal things to you that will help heal your emotional and mental turmoil and bondage. 
One of the things that he may tell you is to go see a counselor. I, you know, I don't know. But see, so, so many times in my past, I have dealt, I have uh, depended upon getting a word from someone else. I was taught throughout, and I stayed very immature even as I grew in age. I was still very immature as a believer because I was dependent upon, am I telling the truth, to go get a word from somebody else but never getting a word for myself. Verse 16 of that same chapter says, You have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is a renewed mind. And according to Ephesians 4, 22, it, he, it, Paul's telling us, put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which is growing corrupt through the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Then Romans 12, 2 says, stop imitating the ideals, this is the Passion Translation, and the opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by Holy Spirit, watch this, through a total reformation of your mind. It's by the Holy Spirit, and it's a total reformation of how you think. That's essentially what Jesus was telling this man laying on that mat at the pool of Bethesda. You've got to change the way you think. I, I, I'm making you whole. I already see you as whole, but as long as you think you're broken, guess what you're going to be? Broken. So here's a good place to review. We are a spirit. We live in a body. And we possess a soul. See it on the screen? So you, you are a spirit. And what was dead in sins and trespasses was your spirit. But the moment that you believed that what Jesus did at the cross through His finished work and the blood being shed, then your spirit became alive. It was raised from death unto life. You were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son, and it happened as fast as you could blink your eye. Instantaneously. Now, that spirit man is perfectly whole, well, healed. There's no sickness. There's no emotional turmoil. There's no brokenness. It is perfect. The moment that you believed, based upon that, then to be absent from the body, that means your spirit leaves your body, is to be present with the Lord. Am I helping anybody? So my spirit man, when I believed, was perfectly made whole. There's nothing else that you can do to change the condition of your spirit when you released faith to believe. And so now it is a guarantee that your spirit, once you, your physical body ceases to operate, that your spirit will be translated automatically into the realm of the unseen and the eternal. The real world. But this shell, this body is decaying. Every day it decays. I mean, every day I look into the mirror and there's another blemish or there's another spot or, you know, it's decaying. The, the joints aren't as loose as they used to be. I can't get my arm above my head as far as I used to. I have to use a scrub brush to, you know, on a stick to get my back now. But the soul is what is being transformed and it is a slow process of transformation so that the soul, the mind, will, and emotions begins to line up with the spirit man. Come into alignment. So this is seen in Genesis, the second chapter, verse 7, if you want to look at the screen or turn to that portion of Scripture. It says that he formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Do you see that? Look at this. The dust of the ground. Your body, pinch yourself. Don't pinch your neighbor. They might wake up. Pinch yourself. That was made from the dust of the ground. That's the body. God breathed His breath of life into Adam, and Adam received the Spirit of God 
And so he became a spirit. But then he, as that breath entered into him as spirit, the pneuma of God, then he became a living soul. He was given my, a mind to think, a will, free will to make choices and emotions that would give him feeling or expression to the decisions that he made. So we are walking on the earth in a body. Listen to me. But we must learn to listen to the governor and the lover of our soul. I remember back in the Brownsville Revival days, we used to sing a song, Jesus, lover of my soul. He is the lover of our soul. He's the governor of our soul. And as we listen to his voice, it will lead to wrong thinking being changed. It will lead to behavior changes. Now, I don't look at the outward man I don't evaluate you based upon your behavior because I don't know what brought you to making that choice I see you as a spirit man and I believe that the potential of the son that is within you is what I want to draw on so that we continue to walk in wholeness now the Holy Spirit will deal with us as sons and he will correct us of some of the behaviors that we need to change but you are not how you act, you are how what he says you are. The only thing that's going to change your behavior is the way you, the way you think. You've got to change the way you think because right thinking and right believing will lead to right behavior. But when we get the cart before the horse, it's a whole lot more difficult and we want people to change their behavior and we give them a sin uh, management program and a behavior modification program and they fail at it because they will rebel against it. But when we talk about a heart change and a, the way that we think change, then as a natural flow, behavior will come out of that. So, what am I trying to say? Don't ignore Holy Spirit. Don't ignore Holy Spirit. I don't know how He works with you, but in my life when I'm about to make a decision that's really going to infect, affect and impact my life, there's usually a heart palpitation, there's usually a sweat, and my hands get real tight, and I, I just, uh, I want to pace. I just want to pace. I, I just, I, why? Because the Holy Spirit is warning me about that decision because He knows what is, how it is going to affect my life and possibly the life of others around me. In the process of transformation and renewing our minds, He wants to wash over you, reminding you that God is not upset with you. He wants you to learn to discard the lies that you have believed, and He wants to establish His truth in you. What is the truth? The truth is that Jesus saw this crippled man in John 5 as already whole. Guess what? Jesus sees you as already whole. Mind, body, and spirit. He sees you as whole. He doesn't see you as broken. I know when I look in the mirror, when you look in the mirror, it's difficult for us to see what Jesus sees. But if we'll begin to see, what do we do? Fix our eyes on things unseen and eternal. That is the, real, that is the greatest reality. And in that realm, He sees you as whole and not broken. Honestly, how many of you is it difficult for you to do that? Yeah, I mean, it takes practice. It takes getting in the habit. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. And it takes consistency. So the truth is, Jesus already sees you as whole. The question is, will you abandon the way that you believe about yourself and change your thinking? Listen, you were never meant to be paralyzed by another person. And the hurt that is holding you hostage is leading you to a faulty belief system. The blame game comes in. Self-doubt. Loathing. I'm not worthy. Well, no, you're not, and neither am I, but He's made us worthy, and it's His grace that's not unearned and deserved. Man, this is powerful. This is a powerful quote. The gospel is not to make broken things good enough to work again. 
The gospel is the good news that you can be, be delivered from the power of those broken things in your life so they no longer rule over you. i got to read it again. The gospel is not to make broken things good enough to work again in your life. The gospel is the good news that you can be delivered from the power of those broken things so that they no longer rule over you in your life. The wounds and the hurts of the past don't define you. His word defines you. I encourage you to read the scripture and allow the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and make it clear to you. My friend Mark Wallace says, you don't need a word, a deep word for your deep wound. You just need the word to go deep. <laughs> so allow his word to go deep into the crevices of your heart and heal that hurt. Look at the scriptures and allow the Holy Spirit. Number two, major on your new nature. Quit majoring on your old man. Major on your new nature. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4 says, By which you have been given to us an exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers. Say, I'm a partaker, I'm a partaker. of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. He gave us great, exceedingly great and precious promises that we could become partakers, sons of God. You have the Father's DNA in you, the divine nature. And because of that, we need to major on that new nature. I mean, Paul tells, told the Corinthians, and I say it to you this morning, I believe that we can use it in this, uh, this way to interpret it to ourselves, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The old man has passed away, and behold, all things have become brand new. You are a new creation. You are not a remodeled, broken version of yourself. That's good news. Three, walk with caring members of the body of Christ. The physical body has the capability to heal itself. I'm not a medical doctor, but I've heard enough and read enough to understand that the body does have the capability. It doesn't always do that, but it does have the capability to heal itself. So if that's true in the natural and the, the unseen, the invisible, the kingdom realm is greater, the body has the ability to heal itself. One of the worst things that people can do when they get into emotional upheaval the accuser of the brethren will attack us, and what, do we, what does he want us to do? Isolate. Cut yourself off from others. But I need the touch, the smile, the hug, the word of encouragement. I need to see you. I need to hear your voice. I need to know that I can count on you, and you need the same for me. So it's important for us. when you, This self-care method that says I don't need anybody, I'm going to care for myself. I'm going to get better for myself. Be careful that it doesn't lead you so far over into the ditch that nobody can see you to get to you. Don't isolate. We need each other. The body of Christ experiences ongoing healing and wholeness when it comes together. And lastly, God has given you a sound mind. Come on up, Frank. Second Timothy the first chapter, we normally, in Christianity and church, we want to deal with the first part of 2 Timothy 1.7. God has not given us a spirit of fear. People will shout, amen, brother, he's not given us a spirit of fear. They'll even give you a little toe touch and maybe some dancing with, but power and love. Everybody loves power and everybody wants to be loved, but nobody wants a sound mind. Really because what that sound mind is, is discipline. <laughs> Let me read this to you. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love of a sound mind. That sound mind is the calm, well-balanced discipline bringing sound judgment to make better decisions. A lot of times we stay in the same emotional upheaval because we continue to make poor decisions 
uh, I want a sound mind. In 2023, I'm declaring I have a sound mind. I'm not, the mind of Christ that is being renewed by the Holy Spirit, this internal transformation that is taking place is bringing me to a place of a sound mind. Calm, well-balanced, disciplined. The only thing that I can say about discipline is it takes consistency. You can't believe today. When you were a kid or a teenager, did you ever pick a flower and then take the petals and says, she loves me, she loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not. But you know, that's the way we treat God sometimes. He loves me, he loves me not, he loves me. I did good today, he loves me. Oh, I failed there, he doesn't love me anymore. No, it's a consistent belief in that sound mind. See, the discipline is consistently, you're not going to go to hell if you don't read your Bible. There, I said it. But you might live in hell on earth as long as you stay out of it. Because there's some things that the Holy Spirit wants to show us in reading the Scripture. You won't go to hell if you don't pray. But you will develop a closer relationship with the Lord as He talks to you and you talk to Him and you learn His voice and then you can clearly hear and make choices because you've been in prayer. But this consistency of a sound mind, making better decisions, being calm in the midst of a storm. See, in the soul realm, you sometimes we feel stepped on, overlooked, crushed, bruised, and even broken. And the sense of that broken emotions is generally caused by what others have done. I, I said that. But as it grows over time, these hurts still affect us in our present. And they, they show up in the form of bad memories, weak and wounded emotions. And if we don't deal with those and change our thinking and allow the Holy Spirit to deal with us, then it turns and leads to various forms of anxiety, depression, a sense of worthlessness and inadequacy, unreasoning fears, psychosomatic illness, and even addiction. That's why it's important for us to abandon the way that we think about ourselves because prolonged broken emotions without allowing the Holy Spirit to transform our thinking will lead to these things. And there were many on the porches of the pools of Bethesda that were lame and halt, and blind. I believe that's the church. There are many who still feel broken. They can't see what God sees in them. They're unable to move because of faulty belief systems. They've been paralyzed from the trauma of the past. But the Holy Spirit in His work is healing those wounds and those damaged emotions. He comes in like a water washing over you this morning with the words of Christ. He's cleansing and transforming your thinking. He's healing us. He's bringing restoration and wholeness. He even wants to increase your faith so that you can believe like He believes. As you stand with me this morning, let me remind you one more time that wholeness is the state or the quality of being complete with no division and no damage. I believe that, that this morning you can have that right now. Will thou be made whole? You have to determine in your your spirit this morning and your soul, you have to make a decision because God's given you a free will. You have to make a decision that enough is enough. I'm going to abandon the way that I've been thinking and I'm going to receive this state of wholeness that Jesus is offering. See, this was pre-cross. The work hadn't been finished yet. You and I have the advantage that we're on the other side of the cross and we can look back and we can lift our hands, we can lift our voices and we can begin to thank God for what He did in Christ at the cross. He rose again. He ascended to the Father. You and I in our spirit are seated with Him 
the right hand of God. But we're still living here on the earth and there are things that are happening in this realm that we have to get our eyes off of those distractions and fix our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith. He's begun a good work in you. Let him bring it to wholeness, completion, by renewing your mind, which is a work of the Holy Spirit. Let's just bow our heads and begin to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Frank, Jennifer, if you all would sing as we just allow the Holy Spirit to deal with us right now in this moment.